Well, good morning to all of you in all of our campuses this morning online. We get to start, before Pastor Zach comes up with our message, we get to start by uh, introducing you to a friend that has been around the meeting house for quite a few months now, but a friend that we haven't had the opportunity for all of us to get to meet. And so standing beside me is Pastor Harka. Uh, pastor Harka is the pastor of the church, the Nepalese church, Budanese church, that is meeting here at our Carlisle campus, and they've been meeting here since... October. And so we're so grateful to finally get an opportunity to meet Pastor. And beside him is Pastor Ken Hoke, who many of you may or may not know, used to be the, the lead pastor here at the Meeting House a long, a few years ago. <laughs> and, and Pastor Ken uh, grew up in India, and he has a, a very special place in his heart for the work that is going on that Harka is a part of. And so this morning, we wanted to take a time at the beginning of our service, just to both welcome Pastor Harka, but also that we would have a face to put to the prayers that we're praying for this church that is passionately following after Jesus and making the name of Jesus known in this area to a community that many of us don't have access to yet, right? So Pastor Harka, tell us a little bit about what's going on. Or whoever's starting there. So we were going to do a uh, interview uh, but it's wonderful how the Spirit leads, because I wrote questions, and then we got together, and Harka said, I have pictures, and I will tell a story. And so, uh, guess what? The pictures answered every one of the questions, and that's the way that God works. So Harka is going to just share with us, uh, and uh, stick with it, listen, and you'll understand his English. He's only been in our country for 14 years, so, uh, you know. He speaks English well. Thank you, Pastor. Hello. Good morning, Church. Uh, thank you so much for uh, everything and for thank you for providing us the beautiful place to worship the Lord. And I'm very much uh, happy and it's an honor for me to hear in front of you all and share about whatever the things that we are doing here in the church and in our life. So thank you so much. And I have something that uh, small like pictures that need to show and then I will explain or I can say all things about that so yeah. yes this is the place that I was born this is my uh, country Bhutan that I belongs to uh, it's a small country it's between in China and in India and I was born there uh, this is the camp, refugee camp. I was born in Bhutan, and then uh, civil war began in Bhutan, and then we were expelled from the country, and we came back to Nepal and stayed there in the refugee camp like 20 years. And then, let's go to next. Uh, this is the strange life that I was in Nepal, yeah. And this is the water system that we used to have in Nepal in, during the time of the refugee when we were in Nepal. And this is IOM. This means that after 20 years of uh, staying there in the refugee camp and the many countries like UNHCR, they started the processing uh, third resettlement in different countries like in the United States in like in many other countries. And we came here in the United States in 2010 through the immigration organization, migration system, yeah. And when I was in Dallas at Texas and we started worshiping God, and I was not Christian when I was in Nepal, but as long, when I, when I came in the Texas, my senior pastor now, who is Pastor Dan Acharya, he came visit us and he shared the gospel of the Jesus and then, and I became the Christian, and then we started to worship the God. And this is the picture that when I was in Texas. Yeah, this is the pictures that here in the TMS, here in the uh, in this church, next to the youth space. That we are so thankful that you are letting us to worship there, and we are here and worshiping. This is the pictures of showing there. Yes, these are all the same things that. Thank you. Thank you for everything. And the Bible says that uh, Proverbs 19 verse 17 that says that whoever are generous to the poor and that lends to the God. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for everything. Yeah. 
pray with me as we pray for Harka and for this congregation. Father, thank you so much for your goodness and grace. I drove past this refugee camp, likely in a time when Harka lived there. So many people expelled from Bhutan, of earlier of Nepali origin, and there they lived, and then finally moving to Texas, and then coming here to Pennsylvania. And we have a growing community of Nepali Bhutanese here in our area, and what a wonderful privilege to have a congregation of like-minded people worshiping you, using our space, and using this part, it's not ours, it is your space, Father, that we might be in worship before you. And so we just pray blessing on Harka and all of those who prepare every day, just as we prepare for these times of worship in our various sites, and just use him mightily. Be with Pastor Dan, their senior pastor who's in Texas and comes here from time to time. And Lord, continue to bless them in this ongoing ministry. And Lord, we give all of these things to you. We give Harka to you. And we pray your goodness and grace upon them and upon us through the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, as, uh, <clears throat> as Pastor Bob mentioned during the announcement time, uh, we do think that the things are better when we, when we do them together. And so I had asked uh, Molly to, to join us this morning. Molly serves in our kids' ministry here. Um, just to read uh, our scripture this morning. Uh, so Molly, whenever you're ready, take it away. Thanks. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says to all the captives he has exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. Build homes and plan to stay. Plant gardens and eat the food they produce. Marry and have children. Then find spouses for them so that you may have many grandchildren. Multiply, do not dwindle away. And work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says. Do not let your prophets and fortune tellers who are with you in the land of Babylon trick you. Do not listen to their dreams, because they are telling you lies in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. Thanks, Molly. I'll take it. Awesome. Can we thank Molly for the reading for us? <laughs> All right. So uh, we are in a series. Thanks, Rick. That mic's just going to roll around the stage. Um, so we're in a series uh, called Six Acts, and um, w this is message number nine uh, in this whole series, uh, which means that it's really important that this message is built on the past eight weeks. So if you're joining us for the first time uh, this week, there's a lot that this is built on. So you can't just go off of like this one moment, um, but all the messages are on our website and you can listen to our podcast, things like that, because we have to understand who this God is that created everything, who this God is that created us. And when we understand who he is, the idea of being created in his image actually helps us a lot of going, well, if we understand what he's like, then we can understand what we too should be like. So um, if you were with us last week, uh, I have to say, I got a picture. This is probably my favorite picture of me speaking ever. <laughs> now, some of you are very confused why I'm in a headlock here. Um, and some of you are probably like, I have felt like I've wanted to put Zach in the headlock. <laughs> but Damon actually did it, right? Um, but when we think about uh, in Genesis 1, when we're told to subdue the land, to have dominion over the land, oftentimes we think it looks like this, where we work our will over on something by force, that we get what we want out of it, and that it either taps out or passes out. And I got to make that a profile picture. Anyway, um, <laughs> but we're called to, to, to create. We're called to rule, to, to have dominion, 
to work our will just like God worked his will uh, in creation. And another way of saying this is to create order out of chaos. That's why whether people are Christians or, or not, there's something about being created in the image of God that we can look at the world around us and see something that's not right, be able to call that out and say, that's not right, and I think I can do something about it. And so that's why we see people who, who hate God but do wonderful things for the sake of other people because they're created in his image. And so uh, this week, uh, I'll, I'll say this. We have, we have some core values here at the Meeting House. Uh, two of them are posture, how we, how we put ourselves in relationship to God and other people. Last week was a posture message, uh, and not just because Damon threw me on the ground. Um, so if you missed that, feel free to go back and watch the video. I go down hard. Um, <laughs> but it's a posture message. How do we put ourselves, what is the posture that we take uh, when, we, when we come to God, and what is the posture that we take when we serve other people? I hope this morning is more of a practice message. Because when we hear the, the terms creating order out of chaos, when we hear the terms working your will, working for the benefit of other people, we can go, sounds good. I don't know what to do, right? I think about uh, my two sons and, and we can say things like that of like, hey, the house needs to be cleaned up. And they can agree with that. <laughs> and then nothing happens, right? But if I say, go make your bed, go pick up the toys in the living room. It's like, oh, I know how to do that. And so they can work their will. They can create order. I mean, they try to create order out of chaos. They're children. And so I, I hope to put some practical, tangible things that we can put our hands to this morning. The idea of, of using our life to bless other people is a thread that runs throughout all of Scripture. Like we see it in Genesis 1, uh, Genesis 1, 28. It says, then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. This idea that our purpose is for the sake and benefit of the things around us. That it's not fill, uh, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, govern it, so that you don't have to do anything. It doesn't say reign over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, all the animals that scurry on the ground, so that you don't really have to work hard. It doesn't say get to a point where you can just kick up your feet and enjoy paradise. It says that there's work to be done. Throughout uh, Israelite law, and we'll, we'll get into this over uh, the, ex, the upcoming weeks and sermons, but throughout Israel's law codes, there were laws about how we work to take care of widows, orphans, foreigners, servants. Like there were laws about how you had to harvest your fields and you, you did it once. And so if you missed anything, it was good that you missed it because that's when the widows and the foreigners could come through and be provided for. In Jeremiah, the passage that we read this morning, we hear God talking to a group of people who are being taken out of the promised land into the enemy territory. And what does God say? Seek the peace and prosperity of the city that I'm putting you in. I think most of us, if we were in a situation where we're being taken away from our comfort, when we're being taken away from the area where we feel like this is mine and somebody's gonna be in charge of us, we'd go, how am I, I'm gonna make their life miserable, right? They asked me to do something, I'm gonna do it in the most inconvenient way possible. When I ask my kids to pick up their Legos, and it's one Lego at a time. They make eye contact. <laughs> I'm just doing what you said. Sometimes that's our attitude with God. Just doing what you said. I don't, I don't want to work for the peace of, of what they have. Why would I want my enemy to prosper? And God says, because I'm the one who put you there. Jesus, in Matthew uh, 28, the end of his gospel, says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go. 
Make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus, at the end of Matthew's gospel, is saying, you need to go to nations. You need to go to people. You need to go to people that you think are weird, who have different customs than you, who speak different languages than you, who might believe other things, who hold different values than you, and you're to go and bless them. Now, I'm going to pause for a second uh, because I, I'm well aware that anytime uh, there's a message about serving or work, we can kind of go like, here it comes, right? We either feel so busy already that it's like, okay, I'll take on one more thing and have zero energy and, and kill myself serving. Or I have no time to add one more thing, so thanks for the list of things that I can now feel guilty about. See you next week, right? Like I, I'm, I'm aware that some of these messages about serving, about working can come across from this point of like, you're not doing enough and you need to do more. That is not what I'm trying to say. Partially. I'm not, my, my hope is that you do not hear guilt and shame. My hope is that you don't hear God expects more from you and he's disappointed that you're not producing more. What I hope you hear is that you are created, given everything in the image of God, that your life can be a blessing to those around you. That you don't need more training, that you don't need more education, that you don't need more money, that you don't need more time, that where you're at right now, that God has given you everything that you need to be a blessing to the people around you. That should give you some hope. That should give you some hope that it's not okay, I gotta listen to more sermons. I gotta come to church longer. I gotta figure all this out. I gotta pray more. I gotta, God's saying, no, put your hands to the world around you. Work your will. And it's, and it's easy when we, when we read Genesis one and two, and we're talking about pre-fall of man, pre-sin, we, we see everything as this ideal of like that, that's how it was created to be. And then things got screwed up. And it's easy to go, I wish I was there, but let's be real. Like we all walked into these rooms, wherever we're at, I see you Dillsburg. We all walked into these rooms carrying stress. Like some of us hate our jobs or bosses or jobs and bosses and coworkers. And we hate the commute to work and we hate the people in our way on our commute to work. And it's like, my job is the worst. And we carry that stress. Some of us have lost jobs and we carry that stress. Some of us are getting health diagnosis that we didn't want, that we don't know what to do. And we carry that stress. Some of our spouses are having affairs, physical, emotional affairs and we, we don't know what to do. We feel used by the people around us. We feel the weight of, of having bills and not having the money to pay them. We're trying to raise kids who are making the decisions that we wouldn't want them to make. We wake up in the morning feeling the weight of stress and anxiety of going, I don't know if I can make it through another day. We have to wrestle with this as we, as we prepare to go to school, as we think about all of the way of figuring out what the rest of our life is supposed to be like. And we carry that stress. We carry the stress of loved ones who are making bad choices, who are drinking or using to try to cope with the stress of life. And we feel more of that stress. And we sit with all of this. And then you hear a guy on stage go, hey, you know what you should do? More. You know what you should do? Fix their problems. You know all the problems that you're holding? Well, just forget those and focus on other people's problems. And we go, how? How? Like that, is that what God is really calling us into? Is to just keep piling more and more stress on our shoulders? Is that, is that what it means 
to be created in the image of God. I'm going to share this little excerpt out of a book. Uh, it's called The Eden Option. I got it yesterday, and I read through it, and uh, there's one little story that, that I want to read. Uh, it's by a guy named Alan Arnold. The book is actually much smaller than I thought in the picture. So if you're looking for a book, and like 200 pages, but it's like half size. Anyway, here's a little story uh, that he shares. He says, years ago, I was with a friend expressing how busy my life had become. John Moorhead was a generation older and had accomplished many great things in his life, but he was never in a hurry. I, on the other hand, was always in a hurry. Multitasking was my response to a world that wouldn't slow down. I began each morning at full speed, measured the day's success by how productive and efficient I was, collapsed each night in bed, and hit repeat. I wasn't looking for a solution because I didn't believe I had a problem. I just wanted him to know the reality of all I was juggling. Yes, it's a lot, but I'm doing it. He waited patiently until I ran out of words. Then after a minute of silence, he met my eyes with empathy. Alan, have you ever considered that hurry is an attitude? I looked at him as if he'd just said the earth was flat. He smiled, I'm serious. Hurry is an attitude that comes from an agreement with a lie. I leaned in, what's the lie? That God expects more of us than we can do each day. Hurry isn't inevitable, it's just an attitude. Tears filled my eyes and something rose within me that I hadn't felt in a long time, hope that when the sun rose tomorrow, I could be a new, unhurried man. John is in the kingdom now, but his words have colored every aspect of my life, including my creativity. It's impossible to breathe life into others or my art when I'm running so fast I can't catch my breath. We think about how busy we are, the hurry we have, and we go, well, we have like this view of, of retirement, of if we just put in the time now, there will be a day. If we just run as hard as we can now, there will be a day that it's worth it. There will be a day when we can just like put up, like hang up work, right? And we have all this time on our hands. And the thing is like, as I, as I have conversations with people who are retired, as I talk to friends who are having conversations with people who are retired, there's a lot of regret. There's a lot of regret. If you ever want to be humbled, read, um, there are lists out there of regrets that people who are in hospice care have. It's never, I wish I worked more. It's always, I wish I had more time with loved ones. I wish I had made them the priority. And so we just think that if we just run, 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 then eventually we'll have time instead of looking around us right now going, how do I, how do I help create Eden here? If the garden was this place that was supposed to spread to, to all the ends of the earth, that we're supposed to fill the earth, right? God puts man in, a, in Eden in the garden and he says, fill the earth which means that outside Eden wasn't like Eden. And we need to till the ground. We need to put our hands to it. We need to create it to look like that. We need to reproduce Eden where we're at. And if we think that we can just run and run and run and run, and eventually we'll get to an age where we have the time that we can actually garden, that we have the time that we can create Eden. I think we're, we're making an agreement with a lie. See, this is what Jesus says in Matthew 11. He said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Now, not many of us are farmers. The yoke is the, the piece of equipment that went over the shoulders of, of cattle that would pull plows and pull meal, mills. Sorry, um, but it was the piece that went on the animal to work. 
So Jesus, in the same breath, says, I'll give you rest. This is the equipment you need to work. Let me teach you, because I'm humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. See, even Jesus had this view that that rest could be found in the midst of work. If we're living out of this image of God that we've been created to be in, that we could be working but finding rest. That rest is not the absence of of all sort of conflict and, and pain and energy. See, we, so often we will choose relief over rest. Rest is not vegging out on the couch and binging the office for the 38th time or whatever your new show is on Netflix. Like rest is not just this pulling out of everything. Rest can be found when you're doing something with God. When you take Jesus's yoke on you and and let him teach you of going, this is what it looks like. To hear Jesus say, Zach, this is what it looks like to work. Because it's humbling to hear Jesus say, hey, just so you know, you weren't around when I created everything. And there, were a, there was a long time before you and everything was fine. And there'll be time after you and I still got this. So the world doesn't have to be on your shoulders. And when we can just work alongside Jesus, when we can put our hands to the things right here where we let him show us what that looks like, we'll understand work a little bit better. So going back to what Molly read this morning, Jeremiah 29 now, this, this is really important, okay, to understand who Jeremiah is talking to right now. Now, I'm going to jump ahead in this series a little bit, but to give you a little bit of background, God promises the land, that's why it's called the promised land, to Moses when all of Israel are slaves in Egypt. He says, I'm going to free you. I'm going to take you to the promised land. This is how you, you know that I'm with you. Like, I'm promising this. When you're there, you're going to know, like, wow, God kept his promise. He's with us. This is good. And the idea of losing that land, of of losing the boundaries, losing the territory, showed either God's weakness or maybe he had abandoned them, like we'd done something wrong and now God given up. And so living in the land is really important. And what was happening is Babylon is coming to Israel and had overpowered Israel. And now they're taking the Israelites into captivity, into exile, out of this land that God had promised. So how do we understand that? If we were living there of going, no, we're in the land God had promised us and now we're out of that land being taken by a foreign enemy, well, we can draw our own conclusions. But this is what God said through Jeremiah. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel says to all the captives he has exiled. He has exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. Build homes and plan to stay. Plant gardens and eat the food they produce. Marry and have children, then find spouses for them so that you may have many grandchildren. Multiply, do not dwindle away. And work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. And this is what the Lord of heaven's army, this is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel says, do not let your prophets and fortune tellers who are with you in the land of Babylon trick you. Do not listen to their dreams because they're telling you lies in my name. I've not sent them, says the Lord. I wanna focus real quick on this. Well, first we'll focus on something else. Uh, build homes and plan to stay. That's not something, that, that, like that's intentional thought that we're supposed to be here. And not only are we supposed to be here, we're gonna work so that it's a blessing, that we're comfortable, that this is where God has put us. And the idea of working for the peace and prosperity of the city where he sent you into exile. Like how many of us would say like that's on our mind when we wake up? How do I bring peace to the people I'm gonna interact with? I'm gonna share some stories. 
Uh, Jim was a, was a retired guy who, who served on the church board. He also mowed the church lawn. Um, he, was, uh, he had vertebrae in his neck fused together. And so uh, anytime he talked to you, it was like he couldn't just turn, he couldn't turn his neck to look at you. So it was like very like 89 Batman, like what kind of thing. And so it was like, you always got a reaction out of him because it just seemed so dramatic. Um, but Jim used this time. Um, and, and there was a moment I remember uh, where Jim, the church was starting to have multiple services and it was this transition of like, what kind of music do we play? Because we have older, uh, older styles, people who like hymns. We have younger people who want like drums and things like that. And so what do we do? Do we try to uh, like mash these things together? Do we try to have different services? What do we do? And Jim was on the board and Jim's an old timer at the church and his voice carried weight. And he said, you know what? I don't like those new songs. But I really like seeing people who don't know God come to hear about the love and the saving grace of Jesus. So I'm okay with the songs. Because if it means that, that people who are far from God get brought close, I'll just wear earplugs. And Jim was on the board um, Something I saw Jim do on a Sunday morning was uh, a young guy came to church, uh, facial piercings, long hair, did not fit in Northern Michigan uh, where everybody builds their own house, hunts their own food kind of thing. Um, and I saw Jim go up to him after service and invite him to, to Sunday lunch with his family, with his kids and his grandkids. And he asked questions. What the young man thought, what he valued, and Jim didn't try to, to change any of his thoughts. He didn't try to, to correct anything. He just wanted to get to know him. See, when I was working at that church, uh, the church paid, they paid me uh, in this old house that was across the street. Like we could live there and that was my payment. Um, the house was, was small and had a crack in the foundation. Uh, it was a brick building and all the bricks were crumbling. I had a roof that leaked so they didn't fix it, they put another roof on top and that one started leaking, so they put a third roof on top of that one. And then when asked like, what's holding this house together with the crumbling bricks, it was the weight of the roofs was holding everything in place. And Jim went to the board meeting and went around the table and asked each board member, would you let your family live in that house? And after a unanimous, no, we wouldn't, he said, then how can we ask anybody else to? See, Jim just put his hands to work where he was he was looking out for other people and <laughs> I benefited from that. See, Harry, Harry was uh, 76 years old. He came to my office. He said he wanted to start helping with youth ministry. And when I asked him why, he said, Zach, I, I can't run around. I can't play dodgeball. I just want youth to know that somebody loves them and that God loves them. And so Harry showed up on Wednesday night and everybody was like, is he lost? Like, we got to help that old man. <laughs> and he was faithful. He was there every week. And he would find the kid sitting by himself and have a conversation. And he would remember names. And he would remember activities, upcoming sports games, require practice, those things. And he would ask about it. And his impact was felt when, when he had a stroke. And the entire youth group was rocked. Big Mike was a, a guy I met at Biker Church. Um, I've never seen a church with more leather. It was crazy. <laughs> but Big Mike was a big guy and uh, could be intimidating. And when, when homeless people would come in to church because it was 95 degrees outside and I watched Big Mike get water and food for him and sit and have a conversation because you could see the image of God in each and every one of them. There's something about it. Darnell Bailey, she was a sweet old lady at church who had a pool. And she let the youth group come and swim. I never saw her by the pool, but she would always make sure it was open for people. Laura had a, a huge hill in her backyard, and so she bought 100 feet of plastic to open up a slip and slide for the youth group and for her kids' sports teams and for the neighborhood kids. 
Frank owned a, a local bar. And when he heard that the, the youth were going to do a fundraiser uh, serving hot dogs and burgers, he ordered extra hot dogs uh, through his distributor and donated those uh, for a fundraiser. Mike uh, started working at, at the youth group because his nephew was involved. And so he, he asked to work in the sound booth because Mike was an introvert and Mike didn't like talking to people. And if you're in the sound booth, you don't have to talk to people. I think I heard an amen from the sound booth. They wouldn't say anything. Anyway, over the months of Mike coming, he heard God say, Mike, I gave you a voice for a reason. It's time to use it. So Mike started leading a small group and we took the kids to camp and there was like this one day we're doing like team building exercises and it was trust falls. And so all the youth go and they're like, Mike, you should do it, you should do it. And Mike trusted them. <laughs> they dropped him. <laughs> but after that moment, there wasn't anything, like all of them would do anything for Mike because he trusted them. They learned that they needed to work together as a team better, but they trusted Mike. Jill had a heart for um, people sitting around a table and she loved sharing meals with people. And it broke her heart that there were people in her town that would go without food. So she just started asking her friends, hey, would you donate? Hey, would you help make food? Let's just say it's a free community meal and see what happens. And a bunch of people showed up and they thought, we gotta get more people involved. We need more food. The town heard about it. So the school opened up their cafeteria saying we've got the biggest spot in town to feed people, come do it here. And businesses got involved and they were donating. There were no, there's nothing special about any of those people except that they love Jesus and they actually believe that they put their hands to the world that they were living in. That they could see something that wasn't quite right, but they could create order out of chaos. That they could do something now where they are. So what do you have? What can you use? Time? We all feel like we're way too busy and don't have it, but we all have the same amount. Conversations? Meals? I mean, I'm pretty sure most of us are gonna have lunch afterwards. Couldn't we ask somebody to come join us? Especially if we always have leftovers, like it costs you nothing extra, just an extra seat at the table. You have a backyard you could use? How about a business? I heard stories of, of people who own a business going, how do I use this to help refugee families that are coming into the area? Maybe it's just your family. I remember working in a, in a small town where there were broken families all over the place. And just the fact of, of giving youth an opportunity to see a, a husband love his wife and a wife love her husband and a dad love their kid and... It was something they hadn't experienced before. Could you share that? Maybe it's just your presence. The fact that somebody older than them or somebody younger wants to be with them. You have a hobby or a skill, something that bring, like you have passion behind. How can you invite somebody else into it? Money. We all feel like we don't have enough. But when we have that way of thinking, we forget who we are and we forget who we were created in the image of. Because when we hold on to money so tight that we don't have enough, we're not living like sons and daughters. We're living like orphans. Do we really believe that God's gonna come through? Do we really believe that he's gonna help us? Do we really believe that there's enough? So here are some uh, this was me trying to put something together very quickly last night of going, how can you get involved? Here are easy steps. I'm not saying, listen, if God's putting you in a place where it's like, hey, my job, where I'm at, I can work the ground, I can help create order out of chaos, I can bring life, I can work for the benefit of other people, fantastic. Some of us don't know where to even start. So here are like easy starting places, okay? Uh, Pastor Bob mentioned at both of our campuses, we have Easter egg hunts coming up. Get involved in kids' ministry. Literally, if you're older and if you can just like smile at a kid, you're qualified, okay? 
Like if you look at them in the face and just like, so glad you're here, go that way. Like, boom, like you're, you're trained, okay? But there's something about when my kids come home and they're so excited to talk about what their teacher told them. We're playing checkers or chess with somebody. You can do that. Youth ministry, man, we have this image of what that looks like, but really we've skewed the ratios. We often think, hey, we just need one adult for every five to six youth. We actually need six adults for every youth. That they would know that they're created in the image of God, that they would know that there's a God that loves them, that they would know that there's a community around them that loves them. You don't need to be experts, you just need to care. We have first impressions teams. We have a, a Bible study on Sunday mornings that you could get connected into. Uh, there's other groups that are meeting. Help out with the grounds or the facilities. Uh, tech team, worship team. We've talked about small groups here at the meeting house and, and what's amazing is that we don't have people to lead them. When really all you have to do is like, do you know how to talk to God and do you know how to talk to other people? Because that's what we do in those groups. There's other things uh, that we, other ministries that we support. Uh, Bethany House here in Carlisle. I know the sanctuary has a prison ministry, a ministry to, to re-entrance in Dillsburg, Cumberland Vista. There's refugee welcome teams. There's short-term trips with BIC World Mission. There's plenty to do. And God's not asking you to produce more than you're actually capable of. But I hope that this morning that his spirit's reminding you what you are capable of. That you can put your hands to something to bring order out of chaos, to bring life and peace to those around you. Because Jesus said, learn from me. Let's pray together. Jesus, I pray for each and every one of us right now that we would have moments of influence and bringing life that may never get heard in a sermon, but that will ripple through eternity. That through trusting you, that you've called us to be here that we can build homes and plan to stay, that we could love our neighbors well, that in the midst of all of our stress that we're carrying, that we could see your spirit at work and what you're inviting us in to do with, with you, not just for you. Jesus, speak to our hearts, show us where we can put our hands to work. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.